greetings and welcome to this LGR thing again. Yeah, it's the Oddware Tower. The case full of 12 five and a quarter inch drive bays packed with components of all kinds of different oddware things that I've shown on LGR before and some that I hadn't until that video. And yeah, 11 different bits of weirdness just all going at once, looking absurd. <laughs> and that's the entire goal. I just wanted a, a mismatched tower of nonsense. And of course, at the end of that video, I didn't have the components that I needed in order to actually put together a computer itself. It was just a tower full of parts. And yeah, we had it powered on with a power supply, but yeah, inside it's just a rat's nest and it's terrible <laughs> and it's and nothing's really hooked up to anything. So that means that there were several components that couldn't be used at all or couldn't be used to their fullest without an actual PC to go alongside with everything. And now I finally do have all of the parts. So that's what we're going to be doing in this follow up here. And I get this thing all together to uh, I don't know, just mess around with and, and admire for its awful awesomeness. Now, I did mention in that first part that I wanted something to put in here that wasn't going to take up a bunch of slots in the back because we've already got a bunch of I.O. plates and brackets and adapters and things going all over the place with all of these drive bay devices going at once. I wanted a motherboard with preferably everything I needed just integrated on there already, but ideally one that was also era appropriate to all this stuff, which is pretty much ranging from like the year 2000 to 2006 or seven or thereabouts. So with that, let's get to the components that have chosen and put it all together. Well, first up is the motherboard consideration, and I thought about a number of different things, but considering the mid 2000s ness of it all, why not a mid-2000s motherboard like this one from 2006? And uh, yeah, this is a Foxconn WinFast board, not the N15235. You'll a lot of times see these kind of motherboards uh, listed as that being the model, but that's just an ACA supplier code. What it actually is, you can see on these little stickers or little bits of etching on the board, yeah, right there and there. So this is a K8M890M2MA. Uh, in short, this is a socket AM2 motherboard from 2006, uh, pulled from a decommissioned server, as far as I know. Um, it has all the integration that I was looking for in this particular build, just because I didn't want to take up any more slots or anything that I had to. So um, you've got... Uh, integrated, of course, PS2, but also Serial Parallel, VGA, uh, some kind of S3 graphics chip on here, real tech audio, just generic kind of stuff, uh, USB 2.0, I got four of those, and uh, some sort of Ethernet. So probably won't be using the Ethernet, but you know what? It's got everything that I really need it to. And it also has some RAM that was uh, already installed when I got it. So this right here is a gigabyte of Kingston, what the heck, PC2 5300 DDR2 uh, low profile RAM, you can see, uh, again, being a server thing, it's just a half height. And I did manage to find another matching module because, well, what we're gonna be doing with this uh, two gigs is really gonna be ideal. And also with the built-in graphics, uh, I believe, that takes advantage of some of the system memory for its VRAM. It might have some on board. It also has this fascinating <laughs> CPU cooler on here, this Dynatron thing, which I had never seen before. Uh, again, kind of a server deal here meant for low profile, I think two U or one U servers. But uh, anyway, we'll get to that. That thing is fascinating, but underneath, is of course what's really important. And in this case, it is an AMD Athlon 64 X2, the 3800 plus model from 2006. Once again, it's a two gigahertz dual core. In fact, it's their first native dual core desktop CPU that AMD made. And uh, yeah, socket AM2, uh, obviously, to match the socket AM2 board. And yeah, I think that'll be a, a nice choice. It way more than what we need really, but you know, it came with this and that was kind of a bonus. One reason that I picked this up, but also just, you know, it ha I happen to have all the things in there. It's not gonna be um, absurd. It's really just no more, no less than what I was looking for. And regarding storage, it's kind of the same deal. No need to do anything too absurd. And we do have, uh, we, you know, we get IDE and we have SATA on here, but this got me thinking, 
you know, IDE has these discon module deals, you know, these, these kind of little things I think I've shown once or twice before. Yeah, I just had to look it up. I'm like, surely they make them for SATA and it turns out that they do. So check this out. This is a little A Pacer 64 gigabyte solid state memory module, a, a DOM discon module. And then that right there um, just plugs in and there's your hard drive. It just takes a little bit of power and uh, that's it. How cool is that? So that'll be that sorted. 64 gigs is plenty of space for the little bit of software we're gonna be putting on there and the operating system. <laughs> and on that note, look, for a mid 2000s oddware tower where everything is just a little bit off, Windows Vista was kind of the only choice. I was considering Millennium Edition, but that's a little too old. I mean, I'm sure it still would have worked with pretty much everything we're gonna be doing on here, but it's also something that I did recently with the Barabyte PC. I put Millennium Edition on there because it was so fittingly absurd. And well, Vista seemed like a fittingly absurd thing for this tower. So we're going with that. Hence needing, or really wanting, two gigabytes of RAM because Vista loves to eat that memory up. So let's go ahead and get that put in there. All right. And uh, that's pretty much it. Again, graphics and sound are already handled on board. I don't need to plug anything in here. I don't believe now there were no cards attached with any of these. Lots of rear IO though. And I wanted to leave plenty of room for that. And I am kind of filming this a little bit out of order because I actually have already tested this out. I wanted to make sure that it was all functioning. And so I did that a day or two ago, just quickly set up here on the table, powered on for a smoke test of sorts. And well, okay, you that, that cooler? Listen to this. Sounds okay at the moment. What in the world? It's putting out some serious air. It's like a daggum vacuum cleaner. <laughs> wow. That's unbelievable. Yeah, this thing is an absolute vacuum cleaner monster. It is absurd how loud this thing gets, even under minimal load, just doing basically nothing but Windows Vista, which is kind of a, a lot actually, even without the Aero interface going. But um, yeah, it, it's just more than what I want for this, even though I love how odd that it is, it kind of does fit the whole uh, idea of this tower, but I'm gonna be taking that off and uh, replacing that with a, just a generic like Silverstone cooler and uh, I attached a Noctua fan to it. So that should be significantly quieter. And uh, while I'm going ahead and getting this taken off of here, uh, I guess we'll just go over um, a little bit more of what I've done to it already. Because yeah, like I said, I already uh, did testing of this and everything checked out. I got the BIOS set up, which is a, a pleasant little experience, uh, nothing too fancy, but it does have a copious number of options you can go through. And yeah, I did test that Dynatron with uh, different settings and <laughs> even on the lowest setting, it was still firing at like 5,000 RPM. Anyway, yeah, I had it all set up, so I decided to go ahead and plop a optical drive in there and get Windows Vista installed. Take care of that while it's all plugged in and uh, hopefully the rest of what we're having to do today will just be <laughs> connecting everything to the computer and then get it all communicating hopefully with Windows Vista, which by the way is a 64-bit edition that I'm using. You can run into some weirdness. There's some programs that just hate running on there, but fingers crossed. And yeah, Windows Vista installed perfectly or, you know, as good as Vista ever is or was. <laughs> it does have SP2 installed and as many updates as I could find to download and patch it and all that. It's not connected to the internet or anything. Really about the only weirdness was finding drivers because I wasn't quite exactly sure what some of the chips on here were that it used for things like graphics and sound, or really I could find what they were, but not the specific Vista 64-bit drivers. Most of the downloads were for XP or 32-bit Vista. Anyway, got it all sorted. It's perfectly good to go now. Oh yeah, that. That definitely needed replacing. That's barely doing anything. It's just dry caked powder, effectively. Man, this Athlon was 
no doubt choking. That's probably one reason it was so loud, but still, just want to replace it with something quiet. Yeah, look at that. Athlon 64X2. What an exciting chip back then. I was so excited for dual core stuff <laughs> and 64 bit for that matter. So, oh no, no, wait a second. <laughs> I'm missing something here. Yeah, this is. This is one of those where they just took off the normal like AMD brackets, like the AM2. Uh... <laughs> Dude, okay, well that's fun. <laughs> so it goes. Oh, well, uh, let's see what we can scrounge up. Three D printing to the rescue, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna try it, see how it goes. Yeah, I don't have any AM2 brackets just on their own. I don't know. Never really thought about needing it. Um, but yeah, got a good design here going, and we'll see. I'm a little concerned about the material. This is just PLA plus or whatever. It's not like PET G or ABS, which it probably maybe should be for strength. And also temperatures. Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to print it, see how it feels. Just order something else if I need to. All right. Well, after a few hours, uh, honestly, it doesn't look or feel too bad. It's, uh, I don't know. I mean, pretty darn sturdy. Used 100% infill and increased the wall thickness and layers and all kinds of things. But my main concern is the way that heat interacts with PLA in particular. This tends to uh, start to get slightly soft around like 60, 70, 80 degrees Celsius, which is right in the range of what a CPU like this is gonna be uh, getting to, at least the main core of it, you know? So, I mean, it, it probably maybe would work, but I would much rather have something like PETG or ABS in terms of materials. So I, I was able to get one of these. It seemed like it might complement this orangey reddish board yeah Ooh. i look forward to computing in uh <laughs> relative silence compared to this monster i got to install this in something else though it's really neat i do want to try this again in the future but once i get the right uh, materials pet g or otherwise but yeah, an original real deal will work for this. Right, so first order of business was simply to sort through this mess of nonsense and do my darndest to even find a sliver of logical cable routing. And that meant untangling, unplugging, replugging, and shuffling around wires and adapters and ribbons and everything else over and over until I had things out of the way enough to get the motherboard installed. Once I rearranged a selection of standoffs, that thankfully went fine, and I found a suitable I.O. plate as well, despite it not coming with one, so that's always a plus. Next order of business was taking care of all the front panel things, figuring out where it all went on this board since I didn't have a manual, and rerouting the hard disk activity LED cable through the Musketeer 2. Case fans are the only thing I'm not hooking up, at least not fully yet, since I'd like to utilize that Kingwin fan controller and it needs three or four pin connectors. And now it's time for that plight of rear panels, a veritable bouquet of brackets. Somehow there are only five of them? I could have sworn there were more than that, but hey, no complaints, I'll do what I've got. It actually means that if I want to, I can install a PCI Express card or two, although that'll mean shuffling around brackets later on. But at this point, it's mostly audio cables, and the rest connects through serial, parallel, and internal USB. It's mainly audio output I'm concerned with, so I'm running the main speaker out from the PC to the Musketeer 3, then the Musketeer 2 and the new Q Gold, and the Plus Deck cassette is going to the line in of the PC. Then it all goes out from the final device in the chain to both the circle fire and the sub simultaneously, since neither have pass-throughs, only inputs. And with that, it was time to start Windows Vista and see what happens. 
which wasn't much. Despite it stating devices were ready to use, anything with smarts has its own software and or drivers to get working. And everything worked, until it didn't. So, you know this 64-bit Windows install here? Yeah, I, I knew there was a chance it'd come back to bite me, and it did, right in the spot you'd least prefer being bitten. In this case, the Silverstone VFD would not work. One of the main things I wanted working, due to the parallel driver, only officially getting a 32-bit release, far as I could tell. So yeah, I reinstalled Vista 32-bit and hoped for the best. And well... Yay! Hey, it's all working now. Took a bit to get here. Hours, actually, kind of an extra day. But anyway, while I was downgrading to 32-bit Vista, I also ran across an open-source 64-bit driver alternative that probably would have fixed it, and I wouldn't have had to do all this. I feel like a doofus, because of course that exists. I should have looked a little deeper, but whatever. It's all good now. Everything is functioning perfectly. So let's finally use this abominable oddware Tower of Terror. So yeah, let's just go through these one by one, top to bottom, at least the ones that have something more interesting to show now that they're connected to a PC and some software. And yeah, this one at the top here, the Antec Veris Premier, uh, the only one that takes up two five and a quarter inch drive bays. And uh, it's also the most reflective and kind of hardest to see. I've got it set at a half decent angle here, but I mean, yeah, it's just... I don't, know, I don't know, it's just, it's hard to get a good angle, it's hard to see it normally, um, in normal lighting. It's great in complete darkness, but other than that, yeah, it's a bit of a pain. Um, it's just so reflective. But anyway, it looks pretty cool uh, as it is. Um, you can see I have it actually set to just go through a lot of the presets of uh, stuff that it can display. So, system information, date, and time, and things like that, but I also have uh, a number of other deals that you can do on here. So these will open up different applications. This is a sort of a shortcut key. You have some uh, different navigation deals here, which I don't even know if that does anything at the moment. Not really. Uh, this controls your system volume. So that's what that does. Pretty much the rest of it is controlled just by the computer side of things and with the remote control itself, which I'll show that here in a second. But yeah, I just wanted to show the display a little more close up doing its thing because I think it's pretty cool. Uh, again, when you can see it, I quite like it. Uh, and I do have it set to Comic Sans for the font. <laughs> because why not? It's an odd wear tower. Uh, you gotta do something ridiculous like that. But um, on the remote here, I've got it set to um, change what it displays. So we got a graphic equalizer there, which We'll go to play some sound here in a moment and do that. The system information, that's what it was showing earlier. This will show emails that you have it set through uh, or set up to go through your email client of choice. I don't have that going. Uh, neither do I have the news going. It's looking for RSS feeds and online stuff and I don't even have it connected to the internet right now. Um, city information, it's just like weather, but preset cities it doesn't look like you can add your custom cities and you can't add mine um so who cares and then yeah auto here is just going through uh the things that i have set to automatically go through and that's what it does on startup in terms of what the remote can do eh, it's pretty much what you'd expect for this type of uh computer navigation thing although it does tend to work a little bit better than some others i've used like the packard bell one for instance I don't know, it's about the same really. Just feels a little better in terms of the way that it's set up here with this nub, but it's still infrared, so that re you know, relies on line of sight. Like I can't use it over here. Nope, doesn't do anything. Well, barely does something. These do different things depending on which mode you're in. So if you switch over to keyboard mode, then that has like uh, arrow keys and then this will bring up the start menu the right-click menu, you've got an application launcher. Yay! It's controlling your Windows Vista PC with a remote, very Media Center-esque. Speaking of Media Center, uh, yeah, it does have that for it. But, uh, you know. That's louder. It's 
quite neat to be able to see everything working all together though like that, for sure. All these meters and analyzers and spectrums being graphically equalized. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just don't, I don't care for using the remote. And since this is mapped to the keyboard, you can indeed play some Duke Nukem 3D with it. Uh, technically, sort of. Oh, it's a little, uh, a little iffy with that infrared. <laughs> um, it's like too sensitive and, and not sensitive enough somehow. This is really confusing. Oh, turn, turn. Okay, I've backed up here, give it sort of a better angle. Um, nope, it's not much better. <laughs> oh, whoa, they're lifting me. They're lifting me up here. I've never had that happen. I can kick you to death with infrared. Nope, I can't. Well, I tried. Anyway, it's technically possible. Uh, clearly not the intended use case, but... <laughs> I think most of the time I'm going to have it set to a graphic equalizer, especially when it's just out on display in public. Because, yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah, so it's not, you know, the best uh, or most fastest responsive kind of thing, but uh, it does at least seem to be doing what it's supposed to. Yeah, you can swap around, like, if you want it to do that way or reverse, like this. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's, that's what that does. Honestly, most of the interesting things that it could do rely on connecting to the internet and to the old services, a lot of which either don't exist anymore that I've found or they don't work properly and you'd have to find some other way to get them working. So anyway, moving on. And really the other big addition in terms of devices now functioning is the VFD here, the Silverstone FP54. Got a, a custom greetings going on there. And I think it looks phenomenal, uh, way better than the Antec Varus. Just better viewing angles, brightness, it's less reflective, it looks great in high lighting, low lighting, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a beautiful VFD, uh, 16 by 2 in terms of the characters that it can display. And um, yeah, you can change it to do whatever you want, which is just awesome. Um, I don't know what initially it was supposed to use, but I'm using something called LCD Smarty here. So you can change it to whatever, just on the fly. And you know, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's um, it's just neat. And I like this thing a whole lot in terms of the, uh, the customization going on. And it'll just switch through a few different preset things and customize things too. So here is just showing the CPU uh, that's in there and the usage the amount of RAM being used as the uptime since the last restart. You can change the, the transitions as well to make them animate or do different things. Oh yeah, so this is showing the C and E drive, the E drive being a USB stick, uh, a mount in megabytes that is free. Here's your uh, current resolution, bruh. And of course, just some silliness, because I don't know, I didn't know what else to put in that spot, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, this one actually does have some RSS feeds that are still working with it, so that's kind of fun. I like seeing news headlines just on the front of a computer like that. Yeah, you can change that to any number of different feeds, but there, there, there's way more that you can do with this, and it's all awesome. I love this thing. So if I start Winamp, it actually switches over automatically into uh, showing a tiny little <laughs> Spectrum Analyzer right there. Got a little progress bar, kind of showing the, the artist, the track title, and the time of the track itself. And again, this is fully customized, so you can make it show as much or as little as you want. It's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, let's just take a look at the program itself here. So, LCD Smarty. 
nice open source project. Hasn't been updated in a very long time, but still does the trick as long as you have the <laughs> correct driver going. And yeah, this will probably bring back some memories for some of you because actually I know a number of people that have used this over the years for different things. So yeah, the way this works is you just um, pretty much input a bunch of different strings here. And this represents the top line, the bottom line in the case of my LCD, but of course you can change it to different ones. All these different types of different displays can be controlled with this, including IMON stuff, which that Antec Varus is an IMON reliant device. So like I said, I think you can control that with this too, but just haven't done that since that's not what it came with. But uh, yeah, you pretty much just insert over here these different strings with whatever you'd like. So if I wanted to show the free page file, for instance, there it is. So that little bit will just show the amount free there. Or you got folding at home things, system information, your email updates and network statistics, you even have game stats. So like Quake and Half-Life and Unreal Tournament, you want the current map going for that, then there you go. Various RSS feeds, Many of these don't work anymore, but you know, you can just find whatever and put that in there and yeah, you can you can just add slash dot or whatever as long as it's still uh, a valid RSS feed, which there are fewer and fewer of these days, sadly. Obviously, I do have it connected to the internet now just for this. Um, I would love it to, you know, show weather information or something like that too. That would just be a really cool addition, but I haven't actually found any plugins or bits of uh, just the, the, the feeds that are compatible that still work. <laughs> That's the problem. A lot of this hasn't been updated in like 17 years, so it's a little restrictive, but you know, man, just the fact that it is as awesome as it is, it works as well as it does, it's just great. I'm so happy to have this on here. We also have the cassette working now with the software, the Plus Deck 2, which I have done a full video about, yeah. It is ready to play cassettes. And on that note, I had to take this idea that y'all came up with in the, the last video's comments. It's a perfect cassette tape storage. So we can just plop a tape in here. And then, yeah. Now, unfortunately, we're not gonna get any graphic equalizer on here because this is reliant on plugins and apps and stuff that support it. But everything else is fully lighting up. So it's very much reliant though, uh, in terms of all the view meters and the equalizers, analyzers, eh, reliant on the volume level and getting it all to uh, do what you want it to is a bit of a pain. Not all, well, actually most of these cannot be adjusted or attenuated individually. They just take the individual volume levels that are on there, but then that throws everything else off because they're all chained together, passing through one after another. That being said though, you, you can get it kind of close uh, it just, just takes a little bit of doing. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is such a neat setup. Oh man. So we got one more thing. The fan controller touch screen panel thing that uh, <laughs> looks a little better than it actually functions, but hey, at least it does look the part. I don't know. It adds a, a nice bit of intriguing complexity to the front of this case. And yeah, you can swap between things there. Uh, it's not the most accurate in terms of temperature. It just kind of jumps around two to four degrees at once. <laughs> In terms of the fans, we have four, or actually three fans hooked up at the moment. I, I went around and um, just straight up replaced them because they were just dumb fans. They didn't have any kind of control or anything like that. 
They just straight up plugged into Molex, so you could adjust them through another type of fan controller that dealt with voltage or whatever, but this one doesn't. It needs those pins in order to do that. So I just straight up replaced the 120 millimeter fans on the back of the case and on the side window. But anyway, yeah, you can uh, adjust things manually here if you'd like. Just leave it on auto, it's fine. I just want them cool and quiet and they glow blue because that's what this case originally came with. So I figured why not? And yeah, that's that's all it does. It's not very fancy. In fact, it feels super cheap and it doesn't even mount in there very well. It's like constantly moving around. So I'm not a huge fan of this. If you know a better fan controller than this type of thing, let me know. Preferably one that takes up the entire bay. This is only the front half of the bay. So there's not any screws in the back half. All right, well, I suppose that's about it for this video. Uh, obviously there are always things you can change and tweak, swap around. For instance, the graphics are <laughs> somehow even worse than I thought they would be. I mean, I knew they'd be bad, but this is real bad. Athlon 64 X2, two gigahertz, two gigs of RAM. And this is how UT 2004 runs. It's uh, on the lowest settings, more or less. I mean, holy crap. Uh, <laughs> you could install a bag of potatoes in here and I think it would run graphics better than this. And I have checked that little SATA disk on module and it's running fine. It's not really slowing things down that I can tell. See, yeah, well, gaming was never the goal here. It'd be nice to be able to run some stuff a little bit better when I take it to shows and whatnot. So it uh, got me going through storage and I ran across this I haven't used in years. This is a Gigabyte GeForce uh, GT740, a two gigabyte model from like 2014, I think. It's, it's about seven years older than everything else in here, but you know, uh, it would certainly be a substantial improvement over the integrated whatever the balls. Yeah, this S3 graphics via Chrome 9 HC IGP shared with the RAM, at least partially. Yeah, it says 256 megs, AGP. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, like you can't even run Windows Arrow. Not that you really want to, but I don't even think you can try. It's it's awful. Uh, now I do actually have a couple of spaces free in there. Maybe I can add some sort of this thing. I kind of prefer a single slot one, but I don't know. Might just install that, see what happens. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. I think this is really awesome, but I'm gonna be, like I said, taking it out to show it to folks in person. So I'd wanna know what you'd wanna see in person. Got some great ideas in the comments section of part one, but now that you see the more finalized build, perhaps thoughts have changed. For example, it wasn't my intention to be so audio heavy with everything inside here. I just wanted things that looked neat. But now that we're here, should I go all in and replace the non-audio bays with even more sound stuff? After all, that air conditioner thing is super underwhelming and the cigarette lighter, that kind of looks boring just being a blank faceplate. I also got a lot of comments saying that this really needs an optical drive, but I can't say I agree. Practically anything I install comes from my own ISOs or GOG archives, and in the rare event I need a drive, I can just plug one in over USB. Also, there were several folks saying that oh, this all needs to be sorted by color, ranging from black to silver to white in a gradient, and eh, I see where you're coming from, but nah. To me, that defeat the whole chaotic nature I was going for. I don't know. The more jarring and out of place it all looks, the better. But yeah, let me know your thoughts otherwise. If you have any recommendations on things to swap out or what kind of odd keyboard, mouse, and display you think that this all needs to be hooked up to. The Oddware Tower's odd life is only beginning Either way, though, I hope you enjoyed this episode of LGR, and thank you very much for watching.